Glamour. Grit. Glamour. Grit. Glamour. Grit. Fundraising isn't about raising money. It's about raising hope. It's the fuel that allows Texas Health Resources Foundation to be a beacon of light across North Texas. Your generosity to the foundation has a profound ripple effect. It can fund life-saving care for a neighbor battling a chronic disease, offer vital support to a young mother struggling with a new diagnosis, or bring a vital program to families in need. Your contribution, big or small, has the power to open doors for our underserved neighbors. Will you join Texas Health Resources Foundation in providing hope to families? Your generosity will make an undeniable difference in the lives of people in our communities. To donate, please go to texashealth.org slash foundation. You guys, I am stopped all the time and I get the same question. What boots do you wear? Well, I'll tell you right now, it's an easy answer and it's always going to be the same. Tacovas. They are the comfiest boot, the best looking boot, and they last the longest. I've tried them all. Trust me. There's amazing boots out there. But Tacovas takes it to the next level. Whether you're a cowboy, a longtime rancher, or a first-time boot buyer, Tacovas has the answer for you. I personally shop in the Fort Worth Stockyards location, but you can go online to tacovas.com, T-E-C-O-V-A-S.com, and check out all the boots for yourself. You won't be sorry. Trust me, as a longtime boot wearer and somebody who likes comfort on their feet as much as they like to look nice, Tacovas is the answer. So don't waste any more time. Get to Tacovas.com, buy you a pair, and then show me them online so we can compare. Because I've got most of them, but I, I want to see you guys rocking them too. You'll thank me later. Tacovas.com. Don't waste another second. Okay, guys, welcome back to the Glamour and Grit. Welcome it's back. Monday, so you know what that means. Celebrity Monday. In this celebrity, I am freaking out so hard. I, it is like... I, I'm dying. Like, I, I, dying. I, I can't. I just, I'm so excited to to get rolling on this. But if you guys are like me and like Sainty and like my mother and like everybody on the planet <laughs> and is fascinated with true crime and learning about serial killers and, and cult leaders and everything in between, you need to sit tight and listen because today we have on the podcast Miss Annie Elise, who is is a true crime extraordinaire. She's got her YouTube channel, Tend to Life, with over a million subscribers. She tops 11 countries on her podcast with on Serialistly with Annie Elise. And uh, we, <laughs> I, I think I wake up every morning to hearing about somebody's head being chopped off or Always. about some crazy story going on uh, because that's the first thing Sainty does every single day is listen to her podcast, Serialistly. No, I'm literally like going back now to 2023 like the very beginning of her episodes because I'm so caught up. It's, like I can't get enough. It's insane. So without further ado, let's bring her in. Everybody, please help me welcome Miss Annie, Annie Elise. Elise. Hi, sister. Hello, hello. Thank you so much for having me. That intro, I have to just say, it was the best intro I think I've ever had. Like you guys are like the hype people for sure. Well, so you know it's you. organic because it's like these are actual emotions we're feeling and we're truly obsessed with your show and with you. So thank you for what you do, oh first gosh, of all. And thank, thank you for being here. I know. Well, what? thank you so much for having me. You released, well, not when it's going to show, but you released a Chris Watts deep dive today. And I woke up at five, listened to Chris Watts, dropped my three-year-old off, listen to Chris Watts, drop my five-year-old off, listen to Chris Watts. I was like, that is my day is filled. I think the happy is filled without, with a little murder scattered throughout. I know, I know. And that one was a long one. I think it ended up being over two hours. We like definitely went to the depths of hell for that one and had to get all of the information out. It is so good. Okay. Let's dive right in. How did you get interested in true crime? Has it like always been a passion yeah. I mean, I started watching true crime, whether it was like 60 minutes or Dateline or documentaries back when I was quite honestly, probably far too young to be watching it, like <laughs> definitely before high school. And so I've always just been very fascinated with it because for me, and I feel like a lot of the reason women are fascinated particularly, and you tell me what you think, but there's like an element of problem solving as you're watching the case unfold and you're trying to figure out if you can put the puzzle pieces together. So for me, 
I always was fascinated with that element. I would try to solve it myself before they would tell me what happened. And I just always was watching it. And then my fascination grew bigger and bigger. And then there were cases that really started bothering me and that affected me and that I felt like I just needed to start talking about with somebody. And it kind of just organically led me into what I'm doing now. No, it is so amazing. And I think we're the same age. We were the generation of John Bonet and Elizabeth Smart. And it just seemed like these big crimes at the time, especially girls, we probably looked like them as little girls. It just seemed like there was such a market at that time of these blonde little girls disappearing or these kids disappearing. And back in the day, I always giggle. I tell Eric, it was actual breaking news. Like, remember when the news used to say, like, breaking news? Now everything is breaking news. But we would yeah. follow it. Now it's the clickbait breaking news. Yeah, everything <laughs> is breaking news. But I just remember watching, like you said, far too young as a child, being like, John Bonet could be me. I mean, it was so yep. easy and happening to like a normal family that it's, I think that's me. That you just had Nancy Grace on. It, it was my, mm -hmm. I was obsessed. Like Dateline, everything. And it makes, I think, escape our reality in a sense, even though it is reality. I agree. I think it's, it, there's something about it. I don't know if it's healthy mentally or not, but there is definitely an escape element. And it's almost like you just go into a trance when you're watching these cases and you're learning about things. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I think that everybody goes through the same thing. So um, it definitely is. There's a big market for true crime. I feel like there's always consumers who are like, I'm into true crime, I'm into true crime. Women more than men, for sure. Yeah, isn't that interesting? I'm curious because you cover so many cases in such a broad spectrum. Is there one or two that just haunts you in a way that it's like, if I, like this case, I can't get it out of my head. I, I just like one that stands out to you that's like, why don't we have answers or we have answers, but I don't feel that they're correct or, or just one that like really, really just like keeps Haunts you up. You. <laughs> Cause I know that. Yeah. I, there, well, the, the one that I definitely don't think we have the correct answer on is Casey Anthony. I mean, yes. through and through forever. That will be, I mean, she's guilty obviously, but the one that I would say keeps me up at night, it's the baby Brianna case. And if you're not familiar I highly recommend not Googling it because I remember I was getting, when I first started covering true crime professionally, I was getting so many requests to cover this case. And so I started looking into it and usually a case turnaround, including research, recording, everything takes about three weeks. It took me four months <gasps> just to finish the research because I could not stomach it. It It's any cases involving children are especially awful. You guys are parents, you know, as well, I'm a parent, but this one is one where it's just, it's so difficult to wrap your mind around how truly evil people can be. And in this case, you had the mother involved, the uncle involved, the boyfriend involved. And this young girl literally was an infant. She was days old. And the things that they were doing to her were just atrocious. There was never a single photograph that was taken of her from like a loving parent or friend or anything like that. So much so that once she was in the morgue, they photoshopped a photo of her that didn't have any bruises on it or any markings just so that there would be an actual photograph of her that would live on. It's one of the most vile and heartbreaking cases I've ever covered. Is it hard for you sometimes to turn that part of your mind off when you're with your children? Are you kind of having always on or all? Do you know what I mean? Is it like yeah. the investigator mind and then the mom mind? I think it's a balance. I, I mean, I definitely, it's hard for me to turn it off in the sense that I'm definitely a helicopter parent. I am like watching every single thing. I'm probably hyper paranoid about things that I don't need to be, but I think that just comes now with the nature of being exposed to how much evil is truly out there. But I have been able to figure out a way where when I'm done for the day, I'm done recording, I'm done researching. When I go home, I just really try to be present with my kids and my husband and compartmentalize everything and just shut it off. And I don't know exactly how I do that. It can't be healthy. And I talked <laughs> to my therapist about it, but I try to just compartmentalize everything and just be present and turn out off all of the noise around me. No, I can't even imagine because there are some times when I'm listening to you where like I truly can't get that case out of my mind where it's just mm -hmm. like I want more. I crave more. I like look forward. I think it's Thursday where you do the updates 
And I'm like, I'm ready for an update. Like, I, I just like, you really can't get it out of your mind, especially the unsolved when you're like living in time or the case gets keeps getting pushed back or things like that. That has to be so agitating for you, especially when you're ready to like close out a case and then the court like gets pushed back or something. Is it like such a pain in your rear when it comes to lining up your episodes and stuff like that? Because we always are like, oh, this is going to go out in November. So you're like, okay, this court case is going to happen in January. Hopefully we can get the update by, does that just kind of drive you nuts, stuff like that? You guys, if you haven't yet, make sure you get on La Polga Tequila. We are so proud of it. It's here in Fort Worth, Texas, but it's created in the highlands of Jalisco, Mexico. It is my favorite tequila. It is 100% agave, meaning it's made with three ingredients, agave, water, and yeast. That's it. You don't need all the other junk. So many other tequilas add all this other stuff, and that's why you feel so sick the next day. La Polga is easy, it's smooth, and it tastes the best. Not only that, but listen to this. Mexican rock music is played to agitate the yeast, so the party starts before the tequila even hits the bottle. That's the kind of party I want. La Polga Tequila. It's smooth, it's natural, it's delicious. Try it today if you haven't yet. You'll thank me later. You know the women who shaped the West, changed the world? And the one place on earth where you can see that and experience that is at the National Cowgirl Museum located in Fort Worth, Texas. As the only museum in the nation dedicated to telling the stories of women from all walks of life, yet with the same love for the land, the horses, and their traditions, you will not find a better place to visit to be inspired. With over 33,000 square feet of exhibition space, immersive and interactives, the National Cowgirl Museum is not to be missed. Open Tuesday through Sunday, and you can visit them online at cowgirl.net and follow along on social at Cowgirl Museum. Yeah! The Fort Worth Film Collaborative is a film workforce development certification program to address the growing need for trained film industry crew in the greater Fort Worth area. The one-of-a-kind curriculum will provide students a pathway to employment in the film industry. In August 2023, the Fort Worth Film Commission and Tarrant County College, in partnership with 101 Studios, launched the program, which will foster local talent and build a robust film workforce in Fort Worth and Tarrant County. Tarrant County College will serve as an educational backbone of the Fort Worth Film Collaborative. Leveraging their state-of-the-art facilities and experienced faculty, the college will provide a platform for students to gain an understanding of the film industry and develop practical skills essential for success in the film industry. The Fort Worth Film Commission and Tarrant County College also worked with several local entities on this project, including Red Productions, Out of Order Studios, MPS Studios, and Paravision. Local industry experts contributed to the curriculum with instructional videos, including a gaffer, location manager, professionals in key departments, including hair and makeup, accounting, key grip, and camera. To learn how you can take part in the program, please visit tccd.college film. For more information on the Fort Worth Film Commission, visit fortworth.com film. Sometimes, fortunately, we haven't had to deal with it too much when it comes to delays or things shifting. Occasionally, I would say more times than not, it's we don't think that we are going to have to cover something until the trial date. And then there's like a bombshell of something that drops and then we are racing to cover it and trying to do a quick turnaround. But there are definitely the frustrating cases. The, the one that comes to mind right now is the Idaho 4 case with Brian Koberger. I mean, everybody has been wanting answers with that case for going on multiple going on years now, I guess. And it just seems like it's delay after delay. We now finally have a change of venue, but a lot, and a lot of people think he's innocent, which, which is bonkers. And I don't understand why they're not standing up and saying like not to change venues or not. I mean, it just seems like whatever the defense is asking for, they're getting. Yeah. And I think it's because they want to keep the integrity of the trial and they want to make sure that they can't have, you know, a strong 
grounds for appeal later if they were trying to say that the jury pool was tainted because it came from Moscow or anything like that. But so I think they're just trying to make sure that they're securing things as best as possible. But it is frustrating because the victim's families want answers. They want the accountability. They want the justice. And it just seems as though things are going very, very slowly. And I need to ask you because I feel like the person on everybody's lips, besides Diddy, we'll get into that, is Scott Peterson. Oh, my God. And how you feel about the L.A. Innocence Project bringing that up. And, like, I had a girlfriend text me, and she was like, I kind of feel like he's innocent. And I'm like, are you nuts? Okay, yeah. I, let, <laughs> just real quick, because we, we all know the case, and we all know that uh, he was tried and found guilty for murdering his wife, an unborn Eight, child. Yeah. And then all, now these documentaries are all coming out again. And people are starting to see it in a different light. And with the Innocence Project, they're, they they got so he was he was put up for life, right? Yeah. And then because of the Innocence Project, he's no longer got the death penalty. Is that right? Yeah, he had the death penalty, and now it's life in prison. And now it's life in prison. And isn't it all have hasn't it all been spearheaded by? Is it his sister in law or uh, his yes. family? Yes. Okay, so that's so crazy to me because in my mind he so clearly did it, and he. In, in my mind, deserves a death penalty. I mean, that's just, you know, it's what he got served and that should have happened. But where where's your head on that? And how is the L LA Innocence Project, like, interfering with these cases and it's giving them a light that most of them, I don't feel, deserve? So it's interesting. I agree 1,000%. I think Scott Peterson is guilty through and through caveat. However, I do think that there is enough reasonable doubt and not enough DNA evidence to have done a rock solid conviction. I don't believe that that means he's innocent, not by any stretch, but I do believe that there was enough material to where it could pose the question, is there another answer here? Could there be another perpetrator? And it's interesting with the LA Innocence Project and I think now just kind of that in tandem with like this new age of true crime consumption, Gen Z who is all over TikTok talking about these cases, there is renewed interest in a lot of different cases, not only Scott Peterson, but we're seeing it with the Menendez brothers as well yes. right now. And a lot of people, it's almost as though. I don't want to say that they don't want to accept what the verdict was and what happened, but they're looking for reasons to where people were victimized who maybe weren't victims in certain, like Scott, for example. And I think they're trying to make sense of it and see if there's ways to poke holes. And for his case, particularly, it does seem like there was enough to where they could start poking holes that would make it look questionable as if he maybe possibly didn't do it. Do I think that that's the case? Certainly not. Well, and <laughs> what we're now seeing is the original, I feel like, podcast serial where it kind of all began. I think his case is they're trying to get it back in, I think, January yep. or something like And I'm like, Adnan. yes, it's crazy that you kind of think it's done, that something can like come back to life again. And and but then we can't figure out freaking John Bonet. Like, that's the part that's I insane know. to me. I'm like, we can figure out every other case under the sun. And then one that seems like it should be so easy to figure out. Do you do you since you brought it up? Do you think it was the dad, the brother or that mysterious DNA that was never like that was found in the underwear or something like do you think somebody's still going to be one day found to be involved? Or do you think that no. person's probably no. passed I, now? I don't think anybody's I don't think it's ever going to come to light. I would be happy if it did. That's my always my answer. If somebody's like, if you could have dinner with somebody dead or alive, who would it be? I'm like, John Benet. I'd ask what happened. Yes. Like a hundred percent. But I don't think we're ever going to get those answers. My gut tells me that it had something to do with the brother. I think the mother was covering something up. I think I think there's something going on in the family. And it's interesting. I met John Benet's father this summer at CrimeCon in Nashville. And of course, I didn't share my theories with him right. because I wasn't about to do that. But he's very much still vocal about the case and about trying to possibly get answers and raise awareness. And it's my belief that the answers lie closer to home. But I could totally be wrong. That's just what Wait, I Wait, what's CrimeCon? I'm dying. It's kind of like Comic-Con, but it's for true crime. It, it, exactly what it sounds like. But it's interesting because it's not like a bunch of like fandom or things like that. A lot of true crime fans do go, but a lot of victims families go. They have presentations. There's different panels. This year, Gabby Petito's family was there as well. Nancy Grace was there. Prosecutors come. Matt Murphy was there. 
News Nation. I mean, so, and then a bunch of podcasters as well. And so it's a time to just kind of like meet each other, share cases. I did a live episode while I was there as well. And I had Dr. Leslie on with me and we talked about like all the different ways to spot a psychopath. And you're just meeting a lot of different people and like-minded people in the space. Wow. Eric, that did Casey you- Anthony show up? <laughs> No, uh, I think if she showed up, she would probably would have gotten the crap kicked out. <laughs> oh, well, in on accident, we have to tell this story. Eric's brother's best friend slept with Casey Anthony because they live in West Palm what? and he did not realize it was her. One of his friends. Yeah. One of his yeah. best friends. Wait, before, after, after, after. After, are you? Because she you lives no down idea. in South Florida. I'm I'm from West Palm Beach, yeah. and so she's down there. And yeah, my brother's friend. Did, went on a couple dates and they slept together and then he found out it was her. Can you imagine? Oh my god! It's just unbelievable to me. I know every time we go visit his family, I always kind of have one eye open, like looking for her. Because <laughs> I just would yeah. love to see her as like such an anomaly of a human. I just want, and it's like, what do you say if you see somebody like that in the wild too? It's like, do you talk about it? Do you act normal to them? Like it's well, so- it was like when OJ you know, was around, right? Like- it was like he was doing all these interviews and living a, a great public life yeah. again. But it was like, you're a killer. I know yeah. you're a killer. It is so. Okay, going back, and it sounds because obviously we are actors. When you become an investigator and true, like, how does that begin where you start making like a living for that? Do you get, are you under like a management? Like, does families hire you? How did it like all really begin when it comes to that? Because it's like we have like a union in a sense for actors. Yeah. So I, when I first started, it was completely just a side hustle. It was unpaid for the most part until I really started gaining traction. Then the first time that you start really making money is when you're monetized on YouTube and then you make money through the AdSense. But I'm not under a management company. In November 2022, I signed with WME. That's my agency. And so they help facilitate different partnerships and different deals. Families, if they ever reach out to me to cover, it's they don't ever co- compensate me. I would never accept money from a victim's family. Um, but the money that you normally would make and how you're able to make it a career is through downloads, as I'm sure you yeah. know with the podcast, sponsorships, and then the same thing is cross-posted with YouTube. Now, do you ever feel, is it hard sometimes, like we'll post something that's learning with, and then you'll get hate comments. And it's like, oh, should I not have done? Does that change your mind sometimes if you are doing a case and you're so adamant about this person being innocent or guilty and then the comments start going off? Does it make you sometimes reflect and be like, should I go back and like dig deeper? Or are you kind of usually you've done your research, you know, you stand behind what you say? No, I I'm always looking in the comments and looking to learn more. I feel like, especially in the true crime community, everybody who's consuming it for the most part is very passionate about it. They want answers. They want justice for the victim. So even if it is a hate comment, more times than not, it usually is stemming from a good place or a place of concern. And I'll I'll be honest, as thorough as we try to be with our research, there are times where we miss something or where we get a detail that's not entirely correct. And so if I, if that's brought to my attention, I definitely will go back. I either will retract it from the episode completely and pin a comment or pin something in the episode show notes or try to just like address it if we're doing a follow-up episode on it. But I think that it's important to listen to the community, whatever genre you're in, just because they're the ones consuming it. They're giving you the constructive feedback. And I've learned a lot from the community of not only just like if there's ever been mistakes made, but also how to cover cases in a respectful way and what not to do, how I could improve on certain things. And so I definitely take all of their feedback to heart. Well, and Eric asked me, he was like, now is she more like give her opinion a lot? And I was like, yes, but no. I feel like you stick to the facts a lot. And I was like, you'll base it off of evidence like you'll say based on the evidence I feel as though it's not like you just give an opinion at least that's what I love it really does remind me of like old school Nancy Grace she was definitely a little bit more um passionate when she got into cases but I love it's I learned so much every time you talk it's like you're so knowledgeable and the research that's what I want do want to ask really quick again how does it get? How long does research? Do you have a team of researchers? Do you have lawyers that look at like what you can say, what you can't say? How does that all? Because 
if you've ever listened to an episode of, I always say, seriously, or tend to life, I mean, the information is, un- it's like a thesis paper every single episode. Oh, thank no, you. It is so I mean, we, def- we have a team. We do have a team that helps us. We have some researchers. We have some writers who help with build the outlines of what the episodes are going to be. And the process, it takes a while. Usually just the research and writing process alone, it can take a few weeks. And then we scrub through it a few times, try to fact check everything, make sure it's good. I have consulted with lawyers on how I can interject my opinion, but in a safe way to where I'm not susceptible to litigation. So what I try to do is I think that it's important to talk on the theories that are out there and say what other people may be thinking, but doing it in as re- a responsible as way as possible. So to your point, saying, here's what happened. Here's what we do know. Here's what the documents say. This leads me to believe, which is just my opinion, that X, Y, and Z may have happened. Or a lot of people think that this person could be responsible because of their behavior when it came to this, this, and that. And so just trying to walk people through it, but not in a way of saying they 100% di- did it. They're acting shady. They're acting guilty to where it's like pointing fingers and casting blame while they're still cloaked in innocence. No, and it really is. I've gotten all of my friends hooked on you just because I Thank truly you. believe you are, and Eric gets so mad, but like the greatest journalist ever. I mean, oh no, gosh, you're amazing. You? The way you handle things, it's what as a kid, like what you said, the breaking news, what you imagined as like, I, it's very by facts, which I love. It's you, you leave like you're watching a case and you're not watching you know, d- defense lawyer, you know, the arguing. It's like, here is everything. This is all you need. Like, I feel like everybody needs an Annie Elise after, what do they call them? The people that decide the court case. The jury? The jury. Like, they need you to come in to the jury and be like, okay, this is actually what was said. Oh, break it down yes, so they really understand. break it understand. down to everybody. <laughs> yeah. It's like you do. That'd be a great job to have. Oh my God, you would be literally perfect at it because you do break it down. <laughs> it's you. And it's not even crimes for dummies. Like you don't feel like you're an idiot. Sometimes I'll listen to something and I'm like, okay, like we know. It's just, you're so effing smart. Sorry, that's why I was like. Thank you, I really appreciate I that. I giggle, your publicist or your sweet Ben Bishop, I adore him. I was like, I really have just gone on and on and on being like, I have to talk to her. I need to, like, you've been on my bucket list. Because I just think it's so fascinating what you do and so hard. And I just don't think people realize that, how much you probably have to do. I have a question. I mean, it definitely is a full-time job. I had when I had quit my job in fashion to pursue this full-time I made that promise to myself of I'm going to, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to put my whole heart into it. And so I'm here today, as you can see in the studio, I'm here every day, Monday through Friday, eight to five, usually sometimes on the weekends if needed. And I just really want to make sure that I'm doing these cases justice and putting my all into them. And so it, it, it's a grind and it's a lot of work, but it's also just extremely rewarding at CrimeCon. I had so many different victims, families come up to me saying that they appreciated the coverage or how did you get that detail? They never even said that in the courtroom. Like, thank you for that. And hearing them say that and vocalize their appreciation, it just is such a good reminder of even on the tire, the long days or when I'm tired, why me and the team are doing this. Uh, I mean, that is literally what I was thinking. I was like, the response you must get from the victims and their families must, I mean, your heart just, it it must explode just from that alone, knowing that you're touching them in such a way. Um, Because I feel like I'm I'm involved with the family listening to these cases and I'm like fighting for them and, you know, my heart's going on. I can't even imagine the motion you must be going through. And then to get that sort of feedback and that response, um, that's incredible. How long have you had um, Tend to Life and Seriously? Like, how long have they been running now? I know it's been a while. Yeah, I started Tend to Life in June of 2020, and then I started the podcast in April of 2023. So that one is definitely newer. Okay, amazing. Do you ever feel, because I don't know if it's the actor in me that just, like, wants to, like, interview and talk to, um, you know, the killers and all these like insanely crazy people that are doing these crazy acts to just like try to get an understanding of mindset and upbringing and whatever I can to like really understand who they are. Do you ever get the chance to like go into the jails or go into the prisons and talk to um, accused criminals? 
Absolutely. It's something that we're trying to do more of. It's just been difficult logistically given my schedule here and my kids and trying to find the time to do that. And there's such a process going into it as well. You have to build the relationship, build the rapport, then get the credentials to go in, get on the approval list. But there have been people who have reached out who are incarcerated. One recently who reached out and wanted me to interview him was Wade Wilson, the one who has all the tattoos on his yes. face. We had the whole call set up and then he got put into um, not solitary. What was it? Disciplinary confinement. And that was right before his sentencing. And then he was transferred. So he recently was transferred a few weeks ago. So we're trying to figure out how we can make that happen. But Yes, it it does happen. And it's unnerving to say the least. I can only imagine. And so when they reach out, like in his case to you, is it to, to try to get his story told? Uh, like wh- what, what does he want to benefit from, from getting to chat with you? So he wanted to have the conversation initially before his sentencing, but his plan is to appeal saying that he had ineffective counsel and that There were certain things that they didn't bring into the trial that could have been, you know, circumstances that weighed differently on the jury. He also has a GoFundMe for a new legal team. And so it's my belief he's trying to form that to raise money, which I am not in agreement on. I'm not on board with that. So my plan going into it is to give him the floor, let him share his side of things, come back with my hard hitting questions of, okay, well, let's, how are we going to negate this, this, and this. And you said multiple times you confess to what you did. So like, well, how are you changing your story now? And just have that conversation. But it's interesting because with him particularly, there is a whole slew of people out there that truly believe he's innocent, mainly women, because they find him attractive for whatever reason. And they're like fangirling over him. But it's now almost become comical and a circus of a sense because He's having his jail phone calls released every single day on different platforms where people are listening back to them, where he is trying to like schmooze every single female who is reaching out to him and contact him, trying to get money, have money put on his books, plug his GoFundMe, all of these things to where you, if you ever hear these calls and they're all over YouTube, it just is so crazy because he's playing women. He's playing men as well, talking about baby this, baby that. And it's just so narcissistic and calculated that to me, it's like, it's very obvious who, what kind of person we're dealing with here and what their true motives are and what their intentions are by getting their story told. Whereas a lot of other people are fooled by his mask, I think, and think that he actually is innocent. Unbelievable. Is there anybody who is incarcerated right now that you truly believe is innocent and would, and are trying to, um, or would like to help bring justice and help, you know, kind of bring more light to the case and hopefully try to get some, some, some answers out there to, um, I don't know, give, give this person like a second chance or, or a better chance. Not at the moment. Yeah. And I feel like you (laughs) deal a lot of the time with murder cases, which I feel like is more black and white, black and white instead of like the Kim Kardashian effect where I feel like a lot of times she's dealing with like weed or, that kind of thing, not as much like murder, right? which is things like that. A lot of people right now are trying to work to see if there's opportunity to get the Menendez brothers out. And there's a lot of people advocating for their innocence or saying the time they have served is enough that they were victims. I'm not necessarily on that train. So, but I, there are a lot of people out there who believe. Well, it's interesting. We were just fighting. Well, I was debating with my producer (laughs) right before this about the Menendez brothers because he was like, well, He asked if they were female, do you think they would be out of jail? And he was like, because look at Gypsy Rose. And I was like, well, she didn't technically murder her mom. And I feel as though, even though it was in defense, like they said theirs was in defense. It's not like the dad was lunging at them and they were defending themselves. Like, I I think that Mm -hmm. can be a very different case. Yeah, but Gypsy Rose's mom, wasn't she just asleep when when the boy, she, Mm -hmm. yeah, she got stabbed up in her sleep. So that wasn't in defense. Yeah, but she didn't do it. No, she convinced somebody else to do it. That she got out more like that. Do you think, has there been other people, and I should know this, besides the brothers that really, and I think their cousin, that they were sexually abused and abused by their parents? And do you think another case or, or no, like, um, are there more people besides the two of them and their cousins saying that they were abused by the, by the father, by oh, the father? Oh, 
some of the guys who are in Menudo, I believe, have come out and spoken out saying that they were abused by him as well. But and I, I haven't done enough research specifically to those claims yet to say for certain or not. But from what I have seen, I don't I haven't seen any concrete evidence or proof of that, that it's claims. And a lot of the claims that I believe the brothers made were after the fact, after they had read books on abuse and things like that. And that's not to say that it's not true. It certainly could be true. I just think that there is a big gray area. So until more information comes to light, I feel as though it would be hard to just jump on the bandwagon of saying they should be released. They are innocent and they were victims and all. And I keep saying, well, then you should have kept the mom alive. If you wanted somebody, Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just two guys against their word who are criminals and like an abusive case. No, it is so, I feel like I would, my brain would be going nonstop if my brain was your brain all the time. Like, do you ever, f- it is going nonstop. I mean, truly. And do you always feel like your email, like, is there somebody updating you with every, do y'all like take on, say one person takes on that case, one person takes on this case, or is it kind of everybody working all the cases all the time? So it's a little bit of everybody working and kind of keeping tabs on all of the cases and checking in and seeing updates and just talking amongst ourselves. We have our group chats, we have our group slacks, and we all just try to have a pulse on what's going on. Oh my God. I literally, I can't even My mind imagine. is just racing a million miles I know. per hour. And, and I'm like, I'm freaking out. Have you watched the new Menendez um, show that came out? I did. Because I hear they're really, really upset with with the light that they're being shown in. I haven't watched it yet. What what's your What's your opinion on it? It definitely was graphic, to say the least. And they do spin a very strong narrative for, I think, with the point they're trying to get across. And so I know that the brothers aren't happy with it. A lot of the public isn't happy with it. But on October 7th, I think it is, Netflix is dropping another documentary where it is from their point of view and where they are speaking out. And so I think that'll be interesting to then watch the two of them and compare. Now, do you see, obviously, you've studied a thousand murders. Is there a, what is the commonality between all of the sociopaths? Like, is there something you kind of see where it's like that person, no wonder they ended up being a serial killer. No wonder they ended up murdering their family. Is there something or is it just like random? You know, there's not really a blueprint for it. I mean, I would say more times than not, if it is a murderer, there is some sort of level of narcissism involved, but there really isn't a clear cut blueprint. I know a lot of people think usually, okay, if they were younger, they must have abused animals or they came from a broken home or something like that. But we're seeing that that's not really the case with everybody. It's not as predictable. Well, and look at Scott Peterson. Another, it seemed like Mm -hmm. he lived such this perfect little life. And I think that's why people, it's so hard for them if they do believe he's innocent, to say he's innocent. Because they're like, he had a great life. He had a great mom and dad, Mm -hmm. great sister. Like, why would he do this? And they just snap. Do you think a lot of time, too, it's when they do snap? Scott's case, I believe, obviously, because of the affair, I think he just wanted out of the life that he was in. Do you think most of the time there's a reason why they snap? Or is it kind of 50-50? Sometimes they just, like, have a psychotic break, and then sometimes there's another reason why they do the things they do. I think it depends on the case. I think that sometimes it could just be a psychotic break. And I think in a lot of those cases, that's when we see overkill or something that's very extreme. But then we see other cases like Peterson or like Watts, where it seems like maybe there was another factor in there for Peterson. It was he didn't want a baby. He had this woman, Amber Fry, who was very interested in him. He had all these things. With Chris Watts, it was Nicole Kessinger. He didn't want this other baby that was on the way. And I think that that was the factor that made him, quote, snap. But then you see other cases where there is clear overkill or premeditation or thought. And I think that's definitely more markings to a indicative of a true psychopath. Now, with your friends and, like, people around you, are you always kind of looking at, like, signs if, like, somebody would be like, oh, or if your friends are dating somebody, especially, like, we lived in L.A. and New York, I'd be like, oh, they could totally be like a psychopath or they are like, are you always kind of watching like for signs of like people doing that? Definitely look for the red flags in people a hundred percent. But I would say more times than not, I'll be with my husband somewhere, whether we're at an event or at a hotel or somewhere. I'll be like, there's probably what a thousand people here. 
how many of them do you think have committed murder before <laughs> or how many this? And I usually try to think more statistically like that rather than like trying to sniff out somebody's characteristics or spot it. I'm just like, am I amongst killers right now? Am I amongst a rapist right now? Like, and I think statistically what the probability of something like that is. Oh, and I is, bet it's is, high. Is, is it high? Crazy. Like, I mean, if there's 2000 people in your hotel, are, there, are the odds pretty good? I don't know what the exact odds are. I don't know if there's a formula out there. I would love to know. I haven't really done much research, but it's also, I'm from California. So any tri- time I'm driving to Vegas, I'm like, I wonder how many bodies are buried in this desert that nobody knows about. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. Now, how do you like, obviously we're all giggling about it because it's like the entertainment factor of true crime. And how is that balancing the the sensitivity of w- true crime and talking like the families and keeping like an audience engaged and like entertaining. It's like has to be such a weird balance for you. It's because we all become obsessed with these cases. And it's like you actually do forget that they're real families. Do you have like kind of a a factor in your mind or a key that you've kind of where you're able to kind of balance them both while keeping the audience engaged, but also sensitive to what it actually is? Yeah, I think for me, I try to really anchor it through the storytelling rather than the salacious details or the entertainment value of it. So there are certain podcasters, documentarians, all these people out there and to no fault of theirs where they will cover it in more of an entertaining way to where they'll dramatize certain things or they'll be very explicit with others. And that's great. That's fine. There is definitely a market for true crime, but when I try it, when I cover something, my goal is always to make sure that the victim's voice is what is louder than what the perpetrator's voice is and what they have done. So what I try to do to keep people engaged through that without it becoming too sterile or boring or flat is weave in creative storytelling. So telling the story in a way that does it justice and you're getting the point across and you're getting through all of the right points and all of the right information, but in a way where you're not sure where the story is going to go and where it's going to take you so that it is keeping them engaged and entertained, but not for the wrong reasons of something that is overly graphic or salacious or clickbait. Totally. And what I think you do so great too, is you add in interviews or like clips from the news or clips from the court cases, which a lot of the time you kind of forget about like right after mm-hmm. has happened or, you know, when they come outside the court case and they do that interview, I think we forget about those moments so many times or the phone calls. That's always my favorite when you have like the 911 phone call on there, yes. which I always think is like so interesting. And the way that the the 911, what is it, the corresponder responds to the person is like so interesting to me. It is. And I think a lot of the time the media that is out there can help tell the story as well. If we are talking about a case, say Ellen Greenberg, for example, the woman who they say took her own life, even though she was stabbed 27 times, nobody's really doing that themselves and nobody's stabbing themselves to the back of the head, you know, multiple times. But it's interesting to hear the context of that 911 call from the fiance. And that tells the story better than how I could convey it. I can't convey his exact emotion, his tone of voice and what that sounded like. So I think it's important to include different things like that. Same with interrogation footage and clips like that with different interviews, because it tells the story in a more authentic way than I ever could. As a journalist, do you get access and like specialized? Is there like an arsenal of information or clips or or uh, I don't know, things with the case that you can get access to that the general public cannot. And that's kind of where you pull for your, you know, your sound bites and things like that. Like as a journalist, is that like a special, do you get like special privilege in, in cases to get certain information? Occasionally you'll get more sensitive information through family members or through people who are closely involved in the case. But I mean, the general rule of thumb is anybody from the street can file a FOIA request, which is the Freedom of Information Act. And in that, you get back a file with the court documents, the arrest warrants, the body cam footage, interrogation footage. And it's dependent on the county and the state. And sometimes you can get that back in two weeks. Sometimes it's three months. Sometimes it costs $10. Sometimes it costs $4,000. It really just depends on the case. And so 
But that's the best way where you're going to source a ton of the information as at least the groundwork and the foundation for what you're going to start building. And then you start bringing in the added layers of law enforcement. And if you have relationships with them and what they will share with you or victims' families or the suspect's family and things of that nature. And then you just start slowly piling on top of it. Okay. I did not know that. So anybody can request all of that information and they legally have Mm -hmm. to send it to you if you pay the pay whatever it costs or, you know, fill out the paperwork, anybody can can get access? Yes, depending on the county, depending on the state. And sometimes there's certain cases where it's more sensitive. And so they'll say it's under seal right now. We're not releasing that right now. So it just sometimes you have to get a little creative. Wow. That's so cool. Did you know that? Um, well, I knew you could get some, but I, it reminds me of like back in the movies where you're doing like the library, you go to the library and you look on all the books and like the files, like the old news clips and things like that. Now, is there one you want to get in the ground? Because I know sometimes y'all send people to go. Is there one that where you're like, I want to be there. Like, I just cannot not be there. And like, I, I was going to say, do, do you want to be at Brian's? Yeah, I want to be at Brian's. Is there ever a moment too where you're just kind of done where you're just like, I can't do this this week. Like I need to turn this off. Or is it just always the justice is always worth it outweighs like the defeat and the, the drainingness sometimes. Usually I would say that the justice is always worth it. However, recently I have had to take a break from child cases. Mm -hmm. Um, I had, I usually, I didn't cover them a lot or something very regularly, but probably a handful of them every couple months. And it started to weigh heavily on me because it's been a few years of doing that now to where I needed to just take a pause and step back and take a break from those kinds of cases because I noticed that it was starting to affect me a little bit more than I would have liked, especially when I would go home and be with my kids. So if there is one that comes up where I think it still needs to be talked about, a great one is the Madeline Soto Mm. case that is going on right now. She's the 13 year old little girl who was killed by her mother's boyfriend. And when they, before they even found her body, when they seized his phone, they found thousands and thousands of graphic images and videos of him with her and abusing her. And it seems that the mom may have known more than she was letting on to. So as much as I don't want to talk about it because it's a difficult one with all of the details that were involved, it's in the news right now. And it's like, her story does deserve to be heard. And her mom, if she was involved, should be held accountable. So it's just, I kind of just figure out a way to internalize and stomach it and push forward if there is something where I feel as though it's going to bring value. No, when it is so true, because sometimes I'll listen and because our kids are around the same age, especially when it's littles, you're just like, it's so insane in your mind. Mm -hmm. Like our kids Mm -hmm. can drive us nuts, but then it's like, how can you snap or how can you be abused? I mean, it's such... A mind fuck. It really is. When you listen to stuff like that, you're like, it's so crazy how sick people are. Now, do you have like a goal in your mind that's something you're like, okay, I like I'm striving for this or just keep on being like a warrior of justice? Or is there something kind of in your mind diff- that you're like, this is that will be I will be so satisfied one day. There are different goals. I think it there isn't like an end goal for me necessarily. I always say I'm going to do this until the wheels fall off until every, until everybody cancels me or turns against me. Like I'm going to keep doing this, but there's more short-term goals that I would say that I've set such as different partnerships with foundations and charities, possibly creating our own that helps victims in the future. One day we're working more with families one-on-one with the documentaries and different production companies to get their stories told on a larger platform and a larger scale. So the, It's just, I would say the overall goal is, of course, bringing awareness and helping these families receive justice for their loved ones. But maybe the answer to that is doing it on a wider scale and a bigger scale to where it can be more impactful. And one of the foundations that we've worked with in the past is CRC, the Child Rescue Coalition. And we we haven't announced it yet, but we're going to be doing a formalized partnership with them. And they are incredible. They build and use so much technology to catch online predators. And they have been working tirelessly at developing this technology. So my goal is as another short-term goal is to partner with more organizations like that, where we can help raise money and fundraise for them so that hopefully more systems get put in place so that there are less victims in the future. And I literally, I would do anything in the world. And I know it's going to happen. It's like 
you to have a live show on Netflix or Hulu every night, just kind of how Nancy Grace did back in the day, just to see you, like, updating you. Because even my mother-in-law, what was she? um, She was working for Child Protective Services, and she went through one case, and she had to quit because she was like, our Mm -hmm. system is so messed up. Like, these two boys were abused horribly, and they got given back to their abuser. And she was like, that was it. That was like it in her mind. She could not handle it anymore. I mean, and I think so many times we see that is that, you know, our system, we we see it in our hospital system. I mean, everything is, there's such a formality with things that if they do check, 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 they're going to be given back or they're going to, you know, it's such a hard, like I said, again, it's mind fuck. It's like we all try our best and you people like you and the foundations are like the reason why I think most people keep going. Yeah, it can definitely feel it's easy to feel defeated because when you do have that inside look and you peek behind the curtain of the systems and you see how truly broken it is, it can feel as though what can we do? Like if nobody if I if they can't get it right, how am I going to help with something like that? And I don't know what the answer to that is. Because on one hand, you have these systems that are built in a way that there are always going to be abusers who are getting away with it. But then on the other hand, there's people who want to help. The compensation levels are so low for those positions. So people can't afford to help even if they wanted to, unless it's a passion project. So you're kind of in this weird gray area of what's the answer and how do we solve it? And there have been incredible things over the years that have helped, such as Amber Alerts in place and different things like that. or um, Kaylee's law and all different things that where there are new systems that help, but it's never enough given how much evil is out there. It seems like you're always chasing your tail. Now, would you give any, what advice would you give any kind of true crime aspiring content creators out there, um, who love what you do and, uh, you know, might feel, um, um, motivated to, to get involved themselves. Is there anything that you might say, um, to, to those, uh, people that just might, you know, want to dip their toe in and really try out what you're doing? Yeah. I mean, I would say definitely don't wait for the perfect time and just jump right in. There are a lot of great resources with different cases too, whether it's through Facebook groups or sometimes even on Reddit, if you're on the good side of Reddit, not the bad side of Reddit. <laughs> scary sometimes. And, and, Yeah, not the scary side of Reddit. Um, But there are a lot of different resources where you can get information, start gathering information. And I would just advise anybody who is planning to do that to decide what your point of view is going to be and almost what your, as cheesy as it sounds, what your mission statement is with yourself of how you want to cover these cases and bring these cases to the platform and to different attentions. And then I would just say, start. Don't wait to have the right equipment. Don't wait to have anything in line. Just just get going and the rest will come. Unbelievable. Well, I am such a fan. I know. I, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm so- still freaking out. Yeah, I'm so grateful that you came and, and chatted with us today. And please keep doing what you're doing because we're all obsessed with it and we're rooting Thank for you, you. And we just want to see you keep going because it's, it's so entertaining for us. Um, and our entire family is our, our fans as well. Um, so we, we're really, really Thank grateful so to much. have you and for what you do, um, and for what you do for the victims and, and, and bringing light to so many cases. Um, before we end each episode, we love to ask our guests and uh, don't log off. Cause I do have a question. I have to ask you off air. <laughs> okay. Sorry, oh, sorry, man, Maya, but is... I had to ask you off here because I've been dying to know. Okay. Um, we'd just like to ask our guests <laughs> what their glamour and their grit is, either of the day or the week or something in their life right now. Something that uh, is is positive and they're feeling good about, and the grit kind of being something that's like either weighing on you or something you're you're working through, or or you know, kind of you're up and you're down at the moment. I love that. I love that. Okay, so let me think. Um. My glamour would be we're currently on our live tour. So I've had the opportunity to meet so many viewers and listeners in person and hear their stories directly from them and meet them and talk with them and connect with them. So that has been incredible. And it's my first tour and it's just gone great. And so I love connecting with the community. So that would definitely be the glamour. Wait, before you get to the grit, grit, where where can can people come see you on your tour? Where, Where like our city's coming up? 
Um, Orange County is coming up, Salt Lake City is coming up, and Denver is coming up. And then that's a wrap, I think, for the rest of this year. And then we'll figure out more cities next yes, year. Yes, so Dallas, Fort Worth, so bad. Uh, I know. I, I've got Texas on the docket. Everybody keeps telling me, I'm like, Texas and Florida, everybody's like, just flooding me yes. saying, come, come, come. So hopefully. Oh my God. Yeah. Well, Fingers I'll, crossed. I'll talk to Banks. I have a, a couple contacts so we could get you in big theaters because I feel like people would go bonkers. Perfect. Oh, there, there's no question. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt, but I just, because yes. I know people are going to be no, excited No, 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 that's you. fine. No, I love that. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to think of my grit. Uh -huh. You're like, do you see my job? This is my grit. <laughs> I know. I, there's so much of it. Um, shoot. Oh, I know. I had um, an appointment this morning. So as lame as it sounds, my grit is that I wasn't able to drop my two kids off at school today because I love dropping them off at school. It's like the highlight Me of too. my day. Me oh too. My God, I can relate really so much is. to that. Oh, um, Annie Elise, yeah. we adore you. You're amazing. Stay on air really fast thank because you. I actually have to ask you a question. Yes. Thank, thank you. you so much for having me. Thank you. Me. Thank you. Thank you. If you haven't yet, go to her YouTube channel, Tend to Life, and listen to her podcast, Serialistly. You won't be sorry. No, you won't. See you guys Friday. <laughs> Glamour. Grit. Glamour. Grit. Grit.